This is uh, the Farm Doc Daily Live Coronavirus and Ag Webinar, Farm Policy, Farm Incomes, and Upcoming Management Decisions. I'm your moderator today for the program. My name is Todd Gleason. I'm a farm broadcaster here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois. We'll be joined today by Jonathan Coppas, our Ag Policy Specialist, along with Nick Paulson and Gary Schnitke, both agricultural economist from the University of Illinois. Let's start out, we think, with a poll question. If you could pull that up for me, please. We'll get an idea of what you expect for farm income on crop farms in Illinois uh, in, in to be in 2020 relative to 2019. So select one of the following. Will our farm incomes this year compared to last year increase significantly, increase, remain the same, decrease or decrease significantly. So take a moment, fill out that particular poll and we'll get started with the webinar in general here in a moment after we get about 70% of you uh, fill out uh, this particular poll. Everybody likes to know how many people are online and this number will go up as we go through the webinar because we're only uh, two minutes in. I'm around 230 or 40 of you at this point. 50% of you have voted, so go ahead and, uh, if you've not voted, finish that up and we'll get to the answers to this question. Looks like everybody has got in that wants to get in, so let's go ahead and close that out. Here are the answers to the question. None of you think that it will increase significantly. 5% say it will increase, about 9% say it will remain the same. 65% think it will decrease and 21% think it will decrease significantly. In parlance of USDA numbers, that would be 86% decrease to decrease significantly. Probably an important number for our policy specialist to consider as we start into his uh, content for the day. Jonathan Coppas is here. Jonathan, good morning to you. Thank you so much. What do you think of the answers to this question? I mean, I think it's uh, it's reality. Um, I'm not. I don't, I don't think we can say we're surprised given the state of things right now. Um, thank you, Todd. I you know jump get me off the screen there. Um, so I guess I'm I, I'm kind of operating as a setup person here for for the the real conversation uh, by Nick and Gary. Um, in part because there's still a lot of unknowns, and so we'll, we'll caveat this as usual. There's a lot we still don't know. Uh, USDA has not put out uh, much information on some of what they're doing, so we're still stuck kind of uh, piecing together um, just from what little bit we can gather here or there. This first screen is just a, an overview shot of the assistance programs, and we've talked before in previous uh webinars, just kind of reminders about what is in place uh, for farmers right now um, and what has been paid out. So you can see here the commodities, the ARC and PLC program in red, uh, the conservation programs in green, and the crop insurance uh, outlays. This is from the Congressional Budget Office uh, forecast from back in March. So this has not been adjusted or updated for any changes uh, be because of COVID and the pandemic uh, response. And of course, at the top of that, uh, MFP has been the largest outlay, uh, both fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020. And um, and of course, these programs cross over fiscal years. So it's kind of hard to line up exactly which ones are what. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, if you want to skip ahead of the next slide. Also, just a reminder, kind of refresher of uh, what was in the CARES Act that passed uh, back in uh, the end of March, that $2 trillion package had $9.5 billion for producers. It was it was designed or at least written in the statute to, to prioritize specialty crops, local food and farmers market, uh, farmers and then livestock and dairy uh, industries. There was also this uh, $14 billion reimbursement for the Commodity Credit Corporation um, that at the time we talked about it red as if it wasn't, it was, we were uncertain how that was gonna play and whether that freed up uh, USDA very much. And all subsequent reporting and comments from USDA has indicated that, that that is a reimbursement that actually doesn't apply until after the June 2020 report that they have to file for uh, CCC. So that is not an immediate uh, reimbursement and thus did not free up significant funds in the CCC, which probably leads, if you want to jump to the next one, um, to the recent announcement um, uh, 
couple weeks ago, about a month ago now, on this, uh, what they're calling the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or another wonderful acronym to, to keep track of, CFAP. Um, here is, uh, it, was a 19, it was announced as a $19 billion uh, relief effort. Uh, it, it was broken down in reporting, and USDA, I don't believe, has confirmed any of the specific numbers, and they had a webinar yesterday that apparently didn't give much more in, the, in terms of actual information. But of that $19 billion, about $3.9 uh, was reportedly going into row crops. How that's exactly going to be uh, uh, paid out, we're still waiting for those calculations. We're still waiting for a final rule or notice of funding from USDA. The reports are that it's going to somehow uh, use 85% of a price loss in, in January to April, April 15th, and then 30% of some expected loss after the middle of April. So again, we're, we're in, a, in a realm of uncertainty about what uh, USDA is going to do and how that's going to um, factor into uh, farmers' budgets and, and, and whatnot, but uh, we'll continue to track that if you want to jump ahead to the next one. The other uh, policy update, or to the extent that it's news, um, the House just released the other day its proposed or its legislation, and I, I believe they're still on track to pass this through the House today. Um, and this is a roughly three to four trillion dollar, uh, another round, another phase of, of assistance, um, a massive uh, relief package that covers everything from state and local government uh, shortfalls and needs to uh, additional funding for first responders, for healthcare officials, and so forth. There are provisions in there. It's called the HEROES Act. Uh, there are provisions in there uh, for for agriculture and food assistance. And so I just have some summaries. I'm not going to run through all of this um, uh, and spend a lot of time talking about it because this is just the legislation that will pass the House. It's still going to have to be dealt with uh, by the Senate or negotiated out uh, with the Senate package. Uh, but we can see kind of where the house is is sort of setting down uh, where where uh, it sees the need for additional funding and, and assistance. Certainly, things uh, if you've read some of the just just uh, just brutal and heart wrenching stories about livestock producers having to to euthanize and, and depopulate their their animals. Uh, there's assistance built in this house pa package to help them with some of those costs and losses. Uh, more money for dairy uh, as, as that industry continues to struggle, including uh, efforts to help with just directly donating dairy products rather than dumping milk and going through some of those issues. Of course, uh, especially crops, again, um, trying to get assistance out there. Uh, one of the things I would note just uh, is this $28 million for grants for farm stress assistance programs. Uh, for those farmers uh, who are struggling through this um, we always want to remind them there is help out there. There are there are stress programs to, to call into and to talk to and people that you can that can try and help you work through it. And so, uh, no matter how tough it is, uh, we want we want everybody to use those those resources. And the house is looking to add some funding there. If you want to jump to the next slide, a couple of big items I did want to just focus in on. Um, we've talked multiple times about our concerns with the ethanol industry. We've got this upcoming webinar uh, uh, next week on the ethanol industry and just what has happened to that industry uh, given the, the drastic drop in, in, in demand for gasoline as people are, are sheltering in place and are quarantined at home. And then the price challenges with the Saudis and the Russian efforts on, on, uh, on oil supplies. So we've really seen a hit to that industry. The House bill for the first time uh, is the first effort to show some assistance for ethanol. And they've got a payment program built in there at about 45 cents per gallon for all ethanol produced or all biofuels produced, including ethanol from cornstarch, produced from January 1 to May 1st. Uh, and if those plants had not produced during that time, there is a 50% uh, of the 19 production that would receive that 45 cents a gallon. So we do see, I think, uh, what is an important uh, bit of progress for the ethanol industry to get some assistance out there. Uh, make sure we don't lose our production capacity or lose more of those plants and jobs and everything else that uh, that 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 industry uh, provides. We also see another round of of proposed direct payments to producers. Uh, this would be an additional sixteen and a half billion dollars for that CFAP program that USDA announced a month ago. Um, not a whole lot of detail again on on which crops and how this would work. Uh, the language of the bill reads that about uh, 
for all those commodities that are covered by USDA, they would get an 85% of some estimated actual losses for the second quarter. And if the commodities weren't covered by the USDA CFAT program, then they would get 85% of their actual losses as estimated by USDA for the first and second quarters. So we see, uh, again, another round of more payments uh, being uh, set up uh, through this through this proposal. And then we'll note um, what I would also say is probably an important uh, uh, bit of progress on thinking through how we provide assistance and what we need to do. Uh, they do include a conservation program for the first time in, in some of these discussions. Uh, it's a smaller program, about 5 million acres uh, to put it into soil conserving uses uh, for the next three years. So another uh, avenue here to, to try to deal with the, the just multi-factored uh, set of challenges and problems. Uh, if you want to jump ahead, next slide. Of course, more assistance for food and getting food to people. This is the biggest issue, in my opinion, for the food and ag space right now is making sure those uh, people who are out of work and struggling uh, have food and that we can somehow uh, bridge some of the distributional problems and supply chain problems so we're not wasting food and getting it to people uh, who are hungry and need it. So there's increases around the SNAP program to increase benefits and added flexibility for use of, of, of programs and authorities at USDA. Uh, again, this is going to have political problems and may uh, get complicated as we go through the Senate side of it, but um, it's unfortunate if that holds up relief uh, for those who are struggling to eat in this time. Next slide. Um, just kind of summarizing the potential assistance for farmers, and this is really the setup for Gary and Nick's discussion, as we try to understand how the budget's going to look and what's going to look like payments uh, coming out. This is kind of the big overview, right? Uh, for the 2019 crop, there's been 14 and a half billion paid under the MFP program. Uh, 3.9 billion of the $16.4 billion CFAT program is going to row crops. Some amount of the 16 and a half, if it stays, uh, that's proposed in the House bill could be out there. And then of course, uh, coming up in October will be the 2019, uh, will be the payments for the 2019 crop from the ARC and PLC program. Remember they're always delayed uh, into October the year after, but those would pay out uh, in October for ARC and PLC. Now the number I have is 6.7 billion. This is CBO's estimate from back in March. So this does not have what we expect to be much larger payments under these programs uh, based on the, on the price movements and, and what's likely to happen or potentially could happen with those programs um, given the, uh, the state of the economy. So just a, again, an overview of, of the universe of what's possible. This is not uh, in any way intended to show exactly how much money is going into farmers. This is a, this is a kind of the, the realm of, of what is in, in, uh, in place or is moving in place. And we'll have to wait and see exactly how these calculate to understand um, what the uh, impacts are by crop and state, county, region, those sorts of things. So just an overview, again, to help set up uh, where Gary and Nick are going to take us. So with that, Todd, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. So if you have questions, go ahead and write them in the question box. We'll get to those uh, as uh, we wrap up today's presentation. Let's move on to the poll. The poll this time around uh, asking this question. MFP payments on the 2019 production averaged about $70 an acre that in the state of Illinois, what are your expectations for the 2020 payments from MFP-like and CFAP programs in 2020? So over $100 an acre, between 50 and 100, between 25 and 50, less than $25 an acre. Now, early on, I told you we'd be picking up some people and we picked nearly 100 of since we took that first poll. We're at uh, around 325 at this point. So when we get the answers back, we'll let you know what percentage of you voted, and then uh, you'll have an idea of what this uh, looks like in terms of the populace that's on the webinar and how they feel about this question. Again, MFP payments in 2019 averaged about 70 bucks. What do you think will be in the coffers this year? More than $100, between $50 and $100, between $25 and $50, and less than $25 from MFP-like and the CFAP program. So about half of you have voted to this point. And I kind of think we're going to max that out right around 50%. Uh, at this point, uh, over $100, just 11% of you believe that. Uh, 50 to $100 an acre, about half of you, a bit more than that. 25% say $25 to $50. And 
uh, we're right on a bell curve at the bottom end, 11%, thinking $25 per acre will be what's paid out. Uh, in order to get an idea of what policies will look like and what the innovations coming up uh, are, may be, Nick Polson uh, will uh, take us through the next set of slides. He's an ag economist here on campus at the University of Illinois. Good morning to you, Nick. Thanks for being with us. Uh, let's start out with your first slide for the day, please. All right, sure. Thanks, Todd. I uh, hope everybody's enjoying my uh, my new and improved image there. Uh, Jim Jim requested a higher resolution. I don't I don't know if higher resolution hurts or helps a person like me, but um, should be a higher quality image than we've had in the past. Um, uh, so that bad joke beyond behind us, I'll um, get started on my section for this morning. So um, you know, I'm thinking about what we were going to talk about today, given the fact that we we don't have a lot of details yet on on the uh, the way that the the 2020 support uh, might be allocated across different uh, different farm types, different producers, how those payments would be calculated, um, thought I would just kind of take a step back and first start by thinking about the um, the standing or existing uh, farm safety net that we have in place uh, through the commodity title um, and crop insurance titles of the farm bill. So. Again, this probably isn't, shouldn't be any new information for any of us, but just to review the programs that, that are in place, uh, we've got on the commodity title side, the ARC and the PLC programs. And if we you know, remember back to the 2014 Farm Bill debate, um, I think one of the kind of arguments for justification for these programs, um, you know, purpose of these programs was to provide some multi-year adjustment uh, period to, to, to farmers uh, during kind of multi-year um, price declines, um, which, which, you know, might provide some support to, to help, help producers kind of adjust during those time periods. And then, you know, that, that kind of view of these programs uh, seems somewhat um, uh, prophetic uh, given given kind of the environment we moved into uh, in in 2014 and the following years where we did see falling prices um, and we have seen those programs um, provide some of that support um, so we've got the multi-year adjustments that go on in the, in the art program in terms of using you know a five-year historical average and setting both the price and the and the yield benchmarks that that determines the revenue guarantee each year um, we've also got the, the fixed price floor uh, provided by the, the PLC program that, it, that again, provides some certainty um, in terms of the, the, the level that prices could fall to. Um, and, and both of those programs are, are paid out on base acres. So they're designed to be um, you know, non-distorting programs that the, the payments are, are, are triggered based on what historically was planted on, on the farm rather than being triggered based on the current production decisions, um, crop rotation, crop allocation decisions that the farmer's making. And then kind of below that, we've got the, the marketing loan assistance program or marketing assistance loan program um, that is paid out on actual production uh, based on a lower uh, loan rate price floor um, for, for those commodities. So that's the, the commodity title side. And then we've got the crop insurance program, um, obviously very large, very popular. Um, where we do have fixed coverage level options that the farmers, uh, the farmer can choose uh, consistently or make adjustments to across years. Um, but the crop insurance program does change annually, um, adjusting to the market on the yield side through, through trend yields, which, which tends to increase the amount of um, revenue that can be covered uh, regardless of the coverage level um, year to year. Um, but then on the price side, it moves um, and adjusts very quickly to the marketplace. So again, to kind of compare, contrast the commodity uh, title programs and crop insurance programs, the commodity title programs are you know, either that, that fixed price floor with, with PLC or that, that longer term adjustment through ARC, whereas crop insurance is adjusting um, year to year with, with what we see going on in the futures markets. Um, you know, the other key point uh, I want to make about these programs before we transition into into looking at the additional support we've seen in the last few years um, is you know these are farm bill programs they go through a for better or worse um, uh, debate uh, public debate 
legislative process where, where Congress you know, has to pass these things uh, before the president signs them into law. And then you know, we have these programs in place. They're defined. They can be counted on and planned around um, at least throughout the life of, of the current legislation, which is typically you know, you know, a five, five crop year uh, time frame. Um, so again, kind of keeping that in mind, um, let's let's look at at how these programs have kind of operated and been adjusting, um, you know, over the last uh, five to ten years. So um, on the left, we've got you know, first we'll take a look at corn, and the picture will be kind of the same for soybeans. But um, on the left, we've got the the market year average price upon which the ARC and PLC program designs are based. And we can see that you know everyone knows we've 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 come down quite a bit in, in corn prices. Um, coming off the highs experienced in, in 2012. Um, if you want to click through, um, we had the, the ARC County um, guarantee uh, price benchmark for the ARC County program coming into that 2014 crop year, the first year the program existed. Uh, based on those high prices in the previous five years, we were looking at a $5.29 uh, price benchmark. Since 2014, that, that benchmark has consistently been coming down. Um, and now we've got an ARC program, um, if, if you did elect that for, for the next two years, where the price benchmark is, is now down right at that PLC reference price. So we've got both programs, whether you're, you're in ARC or PLC, with, with, with price coverage right at that $3.70 level. And if we look at where USDA has got corn prices uh, for, for 2019, um, we're at you know, 360 a bushel was their latest projection, moving down to 320 um, for 2020. So um, both this year and next year looking at, at triggering uh, payments, uh, definitely from that PLC program and, and potentially even from our county. Same thing on the crop insurance side. Again, the, the story here is just how these, the, the coverage and the, and the risk that's covered by these programs has tended to adjust over the last few years. We've seen a pretty consistent decline in that projected insurance price that we've seen each year. You know, we were as high as six dollars a bushel in 2011, um, down to I think 388 for this year. And if we look ahead, if we were setting the insurance price for 2021 20, yesterday, that December 21 21 contract was at 363. So, you know, just just since 2014, we've seen um, you know, reductions in the effective amount of revenue or the price levels that, that both the commodity title and crop insurance programs provide. Um, go ahead and, and go to the soybean slide now. Again, the, the story is very much the same. Uh, we can click ahead and see where that ARC County guarantee has come down from 1227 in 2014 uh, down to 925 for 2020. Um, so that could even continue to, to move down even further down to that 840 uh, PLC reference price if we continue to have these low prices. Looking at the, the USDA projection for the marketing year average for 2020, um, being below that reference price for the, for the first time at, at $8.20. Again, the, the same story on the crop insurance side, a downward trend in those projected insurance prices over the last 10 years. And again, if we were setting projected insurance price for next year, uh, based on current market activity, uh, we'd be looking at a, an $8.35. Uh, insurance price for 2021. Well, we won't be setting that until until February, but if we were setting it today, that's what that November harvest contract uh, was trading at yesterday. All right, so you know, again, that was kind of a review of, of the programs we have in place in the Farm Bill, um, how the, the the coverage provided by those things has been adjusting down uh, consistently, uh, pretty consistently since the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and now we get to 2018, 2019, 2020, and we're just hit by one whammy after another between trade wars uh, in 2018, continued trade war and flooding in 2019, and then the, the COVID pandemic uh, here in 2020. And Jonathan outlined, um, you know, the, the the level of payments that that went out for the, the MFP program. Uh, we also had the prevent plant top up. Uh, payments that went out in 2019, and then now the, the the pots of money that have at least been defined uh, going towards agriculture in both the CARES Act with CFAP as well as the PPP and IDLE programs, um, and then what's what's currently in the House with the Heroes Act. 
Um, if you want to uh, click one more time, you know, it's pretty astounding the the amount of funding that's gone out in these ad hoc programs um, via MFP, uh, the prevent plant, the, the stimulus packages this year, um, and it's also you know, you know, by necessity uh, a very much uh, very different process than we than we see with these with these farm bill programs. So, you know, the big question I think is what what do we expect for for 2021? Um, you know, can we continue to count on these these kind of ad hoc as needed support programs? Um, you know, they're, they're much harder to plan around um, than, than what we see in the crop insurance program and those commodity title programs. And then the, the last slide here, at least on my part, is, is kind of segueing into some of the, the budget numbers that Gary's going to share with you. Um, and then maybe some of the recommendations we're, we're thinking about and from a farm management perspective. Um, you know, this is a this is a picture we use quite often in terms of looking at operator and land returns, um, at least on average in, in central Illinois, uh, going back over the last 20 years, we can see the, the higher returns we experienced from, from 07 to 2012, uh, the increase in cash rents during that time period, but still earning return levels that, that more than covered those uh, cash rent land costs. And then, you know, moving into this most recent era of low commodity prices, uh, we see some adjustment in cash rents, um, you know, moving from 14 to 15, uh, 16 to 17. Uh, but basically, since 2017, on average, we haven't seen much movement um, in cash rent levels. Um, and the other thing to, to point out here is, is, you know, the portion of the operator land returns that have been accounted for by some of these ad hoc programs. So the MFP support in 18 and 19. And then what we might expect to come from from CFAP and some of the other COVID stimulus packages uh, for, for 19 and 20. You know, anecdotally, we hear a lot about uh, the fact that, you know, these, these payments are, are necessary, they're needed, but at the same time, they also don't allow for much expense adjustment, particularly on the cash rent side of things. Um, and so it's, it's you know, the, the big question, and again, segueing into Gary, is, is what happens in 2021? Um, and, and how do we think about that in, in terms of planning for 2021 um, and looking at, um, you know, negotiating, you know, cash rent levels for next year, um, you know, and, and where we're at right now, if we think about what 2021 might look like uh, without continued support through some sort of CFAP or MFP like program is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary, but we're kind of back to what we were looking at in the 1980s with, with corn in the low $3 range, beans in the low $8 range, um, and obviously cost structures that are you know, much higher um, and, and, and too high uh, given, those, given those corn and soybean prices. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Todd and, and let, Gary, uh, let Gary take it away. Yeah, well, let's make that transition to Gary pretty quickly. We'll start out with this poll question as we look into 2021. So this is a poll question about next year, not about this year. Uh, do you expect MFP and CF and CFAP like payments to be um, over 50 bucks between zero and fifty dollars, or that you expect a continuation of these programs in 2021? So do you continue will what do you expect MFP and CFAP like payments to be in 2021 to continue over $50 an acre between zero and $50 or that you do not expect, do not expect a continuation of these programs in 2021? Go ahead and take a moment and fill that out and we'll get started with Gary Schnitke here. Uh, right at this point, 325 attendees still online and it looks like we're going to about half of you are going to vote. Um, so that's what the poll will look like. Go ahead and I think close the poll out. Gary Schnitke, the 25% say that uh, $50 an acre will continue. Half say between zero and $50 and 26% say they don't think anything will come in 2021. Kind of a classic bell curve. What do you think? So, well, that, that is a good question, Todd, and uh, we obviously don't know the answer to that, but uh, I'm going to take you through some of the budget numbers that, uh, that uh, Nick ended up with and just show you what we're thinking things look like. This happens to be corn and soybeans for 2018, 2019, and 2020. 2018 and 2019 are 
our summaries from FBFM in 2020 are uh, our projections for 2020. Uh, just a couple of notes here. 2019 return of farming has been lowered because of lower prices. Uh, we've lowered those prices 20 to 30 cents for corn is about the same for soybeans. They are now sitting at 355, 855 for soybeans. And again, that we've lowered those because of the, the lowering of cash prices and what we're likely to see as far as uh, far as lower returns. And obviously that will vary depending on farm to farm, depending on how much was marketed. We are actually putting in here a hundred dollars for CFAP for 2019 or, or 2020. So this is what's going to get paid in 2020. And we obviously do not know this, but we're putting in a hundred dollars and you can see how we've allocated that. We put $20 of CFAP on the 2019 crop. Again, saying that that's supposed to be compensating for, for 2019 losses and then $80 for 2020. Again, we don't know that, and and the language of this is 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 if you look at the House bill, we're all seem to be still talking about first and second quarter losses, which would imply something about 2019 losses. But we've just put in a hundred dollars in here, and again, those are not certain. With 20 of that associated with the 2019 crop, 80 with the 2020. Um, even given that we're looking at overall or lower returns from 2019 to 2020, corn in particular, we're going down from minus 21 to 48. Soybeans go up a bit from 22 to 34, but that's maybe just an artifact because of we're putting about the same number of CFAP dollars on corn and soybeans. Again, if you average those together, uh, corn or soybean or corn and soybeans look worse in 2020 than they did in 2019. Again, that would be with $100 of support. If you take away that $100 of support, uh, things look look worse. And again, we're building in a trend line yield in here. For corn, we put in 215 bushels per acre, 320 price. Actually, if we have a bump trend line yield in here, I would think we would be lowering the price to three dollars and perhaps below just given where we're at so if you're thinking we'll produce our way out of it well that would probably also result in lower prices then let's look at 2021 and we built in a bit higher prices no additional payments and again here we're, we're putting in no additional payments on cfap mfp and again, well, that's arguable, but here's the thought. It's after the election. Uh, we don't know who's going to get elected. And um, counting on those uh, may or may not happen. But if we don't put anything in there, we do, again, get much lower returns. We, again, take a step down. Uh, we essentially see soy corn coming down 50 bucks and soybeans more than that. Again, a lot of that because we're taking away that $80 of CFAP payments into 2021. Um, that raises some issues. And I guess from my perspective, the big one is, is that the next big decision, or there's a lot of big decisions, but actually the next big decision will begin to be made in August, September, October. And that will be setting cash rents for 2021. And I, at this point, I, we would be suggesting to be very careful in setting 2021 cash rents. And there may not be a MFP and CFAP payments in 2021. And I, I, I don't know what, what those will be. Expectations so from the audience are that 50% of you believe it's between zero and $50. And again, if that, if that is the case, we're still looking at losses. I would suggest... So evaluate, evaluating price prospects at the end of the summer. We'll know what the future market is saying, what 2021 looks like. And if they're suggesting low $3 corn and low $8 soybean cash prices for 2021, either lower cash rents or use a variable cash rent. And that sounds like a broken record from us. But uh, again, this is the, this, this COVID-19 and depending on how long the tails are, uh, 2021 could be a, 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 year, a poor year. 
if you're going to use a cash rent um, and not lower it, particularly if you're not going to lower the cash rent, I would suggest building in a clause where you base cash rent levels with or without additional MFP and CFAT payments in 2021. Again, if you look at 2020, 2019, 2018, the MFP CFAT payments are going to be important parts of income and have been what has been making our economics work. So looking forward to 2021, be uh, be cautious setting those 2021 cash rents. Here's sort of general advice at this point in time. And with additional aid, government aid, and it's more than the $3.9 billion announced in the CFAP program or what was announced by the administration for covering 2019 loss, uh, it, it, and, uh, and it would include something from the HEROES programs, uh, most far crop farms will be okay at the end of 2020. Not great and not without financial losses, and I guess 2021 is a question. Are we looking at a continuation of low $3 corn into 2021, low $8 soybeans in 2021? And that is a real possibility. Right now, if you've got any acres left, plant, consider planting soybeans on them because uh, soybeans have taken less of a hit than corn. Consider the PAPP and IDL programs, and both of those are from SBA. If you haven't made an application, think about it. Um, the last time we checked, PPP loan programs had 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 money, and by all means, conserve all working capital that you've got. I guess uh, I think a lot of people hit the pause on 2019 crop marketing. I think you're going to have to start marketing that again with the fact that we do now have a lower prices and adjust 2020 crop marketing goals to these lower prices. Now, we may think that we're looking at low prices now, and we are looking at low prices, but they could be worse with a bumper crop and a bumper crop um, a, uh, above trend line yields and the acres that we're, 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 we're planting now, we could have below $3 corn, below $8 soybean prices. So hedging some of those now or continuing the hedging selling process probably is a prudent risk management move. And again, there's a danger point in setting cash rents for 2021. So that's um, sort of where we think we are at. And I'll turn this over back to back, back to Todd. Hey, thank you so much. If you have questions for Gary or uh, for Nick or for Jonathan, go ahead and write them in at this point. We'll get to them momentarily. We would like to thank our sponsors here at FarmDoc, including TIAA, the Center for Farmland Research. That's right here on campus. In fact, at Mumford Hall, about uh, three, actually four floors up because he's in the basement from Gary at this point. Uh, you can find them at farmland.illinois.ed. You, uh, Compere Financial and Farm Credit also sponsoring us along with FS Growmark and the Illinois Corn Growers Association. And of course, uh, the Agricultural and Consumer Economics Department here in the College of Agricultural Consumer and Environmental Sciences. Now, there are a couple of things coming up next week. Don't forget that on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, the next in this webinar series will be about the ethanol industry going forward. And then on Friday, We'll take up the pork industry, a perspective from the mash-offs. They're an Illinois-based uh, hog and poultry production uh, facility, actually a you know, company, family-owned uh, in uh, that uh, St. Louis area. Uh, they usually hail from Carlinville most of the time. So if you want to join us for that, we'd be sure glad to have you on. Let's get to some of the questions at this point. Gentlemen, if you could turn your uh, webcams on, we'll take some of the questions. Uh, and I'll start with this question because it comes up all the time. When the current, current farm bill was passed, what was the estimated cost uh, for the commodity title? Do we have an idea? I think Jonathan Coppice or Nick, do you recall what that number was? Yeah, <clears throat> commodity programs gen generally ran between five and six billion a year fiscal year all the way out. So <clears throat> that was pretty consistent from uh, uh, looking at the January CBO estimates had them, had them out about 5 billion, 4.75 billion in PLC. Next question, what uh, would it make sense, this question gets asked often too, 
to go back to the set aside programs. Uh, <laughs> I think you have your answer there, <laughs> but <laughs> so here's I'll 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 feel this and give Nick a minute to uh, to think a more uh, uh, brilliant answer than I can ever come up with. But I I uh, here's what I'd say about set aside programs. Um, they've historically not worked uh, great in terms of reducing production. Well, you either ship production overseas and, and comp competing farmer and nations uh, pick up those acres. But also we tend to see the worst acres go into a set-aside program and then a, an intensification of production on the acres that remain. And so your yields don't take, uh, don't see the reduction that you need uh, or that the set-aside program is designed uh, to try and, and achieve. So we've not seen them succeed maybe the closest exception is 1983's massive pick program that managed to get about 78 million acres out of production uh couple that with a drought and we did see a, a reduced production that year um but i do think there is room and you see this in the heroes act there's room to think through things like the an expansion of the like continuous practices maybe we can get in buffer strips and waterways and some other things on a larger scale basis Will it cut production? Probably not. But but again, there may be some some room there to you to expand some policies to achieve more than just the production goals. Um, but Nick, sorry, I don't I don't know. I've not seen any historical example of set asides really helping we, with kind of, prices and production. It's clear we've we've been successful in the last six or seven years, kind of turning Jonathan into an economist here. Um, but uh, you know. If you, if you want to give an economist, ag economist heartburn, you, you, you bring up this idea of, of going back to supply management tactics. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, the historical record of those isn't great. You know, the 1996 Farm Bill was all about you know, reversing direction and getting away from those ineffective policies and, and going back more to free market, uh, letting the farmer plant to what the market indicators were, were, were telling them. Um, and you know, in addition to the the relative ineffectiveness of implementing the programs on on domestic production itself, you know, we're also in a, in a very global marketplace. So, you know, any acres we take out of production uh, just might create opportunities for the Brazils and the Russias and the Africas of the world to 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 increase those acres and 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 take that uh, take that market position um, potentially away from us long term. So. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I'll add on to that from what Jonathan said. Gary Schnitke from the western part of the Corn Belt. This question comes in with PLC in the money, RP crop insurance near the money at current prices, and expected CFAP payments as well. Is there any downside risk left in the farm income from lower crop prices this year? Yeah, that that is a that is the case for corn. And by the way. If we're looking at RP crop insurance, you have to look, remember that those are not based on cash prices. They are based on, 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 on futures prices. And we're just right at the point where corn, uh, where if you have an 85% RP and an 85% RP that you're, if you have exactly the same yield as you do for, uh, as your guarantee yield, uh, you're at the point where that might pay. If you're at an 80% coverage level or below that, that is not the case. So that is the other thing to take into consideration there. It's just at that, le at that level. Um, I would, I, so, so that's the corn side. And by the way, you also have to remember that the PLC payments are made on base acres. So, so it's, it's decoupled. So if you're looking at that, it's decoupled. So attributing that to corn uh, might not uh, might not uh, might not be totally appropriate. There is still quite a bit of downside on the soybean side because soybeans would have to fall below eight dollars uh, November contract. By the way, before that would trigger payment. So um, it's somewhat ironic. But our most profitable crop, which is negative, is soybeans, and it still does have some downside risk. Um, so um, we're getting close, but we're, we could still see worse, uh, worse, a worse scenario. 
actually for the long run probably your worst scenario is that you have have higher than trend yields um so think uh think 20 bushels above corn yields you would have to see the if if we're getting that you would have to see your rp in the december corn price to be roughly three dollars so you still wouldn't be triggering payments you would still be looking at corn prices then below well below three dollars and you would be having a carry out into 2021 because of the large supplies that would further depress 2021 price so yeah this year we might be getting to the near near the the bottom but uh, 2021 becomes concerning gary on the farm doc site farmdoc.illinois.edu not farm doc daily there are always uh cash rent and share rent agreements will you be updating those to include language for what you suggested for the coming year yeah we're going to get jonathan on that so he's not being playing an economist and writing that but no yes we will, <laughs> we, we will be doing that absolutely um but and, and again um you know i don't want to be i mean the, the we should be optimistic about agriculture but the next year you do get concerned about that and bidding a cash rent with three dollar corn no assurance of uh ad hoc disaster assistance which has been adding eighty dollars per year for the last two three years you've got to be concerned how concerned should the ag community be that the aggregate measures of support will exceed agreed to uh, those agreed to at wto or about the wto in general i didn't assign that nobody wants to take it apparently <laughs> <laughs> i'll wait to see if nick this, the good thing about having the cameras on see if nick uh had I mean, I think if we're going to be honest about it, I think all all sort of bets are off with WTO, agri those things right now. Um, I, I don't see in, in the middle of this pandemic um, that, that the WTO provisions get too applicable. What, what I would be concerned about is the longer term implications from uh, President Trump's trade and tariff conflicts all the way through this the longer term implications of this WTO system that really we put in place, that the United States led the way to put this in place to avoid tariff conflicts that, that impact uh, economies and that fed into previous problems. So, you know, it, it's going to be one of those things I think that uh, we, we come out of this pandemic um, and we can start to think about a uh, longer term, how we keep rules in place for reasonable and fair trading uh, around the world, it's going to be important. But right now, I don't think aggregate measures and I don't think WTO is is going to come to play. On the Heroes Act conservation but, portion, but, but but I don't. I also don't think budget is a concern at all. <laughs> We're going to blow through the billions of dollars in support. Trillions. Trillions. On the Heroes Act conservation portion, would the seventy dollars and thirty dollar payments be each year, or is that just a one year total? Oh, that's good. So, the seventy dollar is an annual rental payment for the acres put into that program, and then the thirty dollars is a uh, one time. It reads as a one time cost share um, to help the establishment of the of the conserving. Uh, cover crops that goes into the acres. So it'd be 70 bucks every year in a rental payment. Here's a question uh, related to the CFAP or direct payment. Uh, they want to know what well, the odds are that payments are based on inventory as of January 1. We talked about this. <laughs> Do we, I, Nick, what, what are they, they going to go pay? I, you, you got the best sense on on how they might be using some of that market i do I, not have the best sense uh yeah that's uh yeah that's uh that's generous um but you took the wto question bullet so i suppose i can i can answer this one um you know we we, we i mean we have no information it's it's all speculatory at this point it's all speculation based on our reading and perception of the 
way in which they said losses will be calculated, you know, the, the 85% of January through April. I mean, to us, and to me, okay, I won't throw anyone else under the bus. To me, that, that indicates it's going to be associated with 2019 inventories, unsold crop from last year. Um, so, you know, might it turn out to be a program where you need to provide some sort of documentation about what you had in inventories at some point between January 1st and any date from then until now going in forward even over the next few months? Um, I would say the likelihood is greater than zero. Um, but you know, that's about as exact as I can as I'm willing to get at this point. Is it more likely that they'll use the weighted average that they get from the grain elevators? I mean that that's what that's what again I'll I'll take the hit and say that's what I did. Um when we kind of initially looked at how that first 3.9 billion in CFAP for row crops might be allocated. Um, you know, that would be arguably easier and quicker to do rather than asking for some type of validation documentation from farmers at the individual level. Um, they could use those marketing weights, basically how farmers historically have marketed grain throughout the year um, to, to create a program that was more automatic and, and quicker to get dollars out. Um, you know, on the downside of that, that means that you know, then you get into distributional uh, issues where some farmers might receive a payment because, but they may have forward contracted and not actually experienced a loss and other farmers might be undercompensated, um, you know, but the, but the calculation was quicker and easier. So, uh, I mean, those are trade-offs that I'm sure USDA is dealing with, um, but, but uh, you know, that's, that's up to them. You know, I'll, just back, no I'll back Nick up on sorry, Todd. I'll back Nick up on that. Look, if they're pushing this these kind of payments out in the way they are, it, it's going to be they're going to use a, this a uh, simplified system, right? They're going to have to go with something that isn't the kind of you know the you have to actually report it and figure all that out. So, I would say Nick's probably pretty close on on at least some of the mechanisms they're going to use to calculate it. It also just highlights the frustration. <clears throat> with announcing these sort of payments, given the timing and the lack of real detail and information. And I, I think we're hearing that and seeing that it, it just trying to manage through this as it is and then add on this layer of sort of guesswork um, is is frustrating at times. And so we will continue to try to get information out as we know it. But right now we don't have these details. And, and, I, and I'll add on top of that in, in defense of, of USDA, I mean, this is an incredibly difficult thing to implement yes. over, you know, uh, over a, a multiple years. And, and, you know, this is something they're being asked to do, just like with MFP, in a matter of months. Um, and so, you know, it's it's going to be real easy for for us, for farmers to, to Monday morning quarterback, whatever comes out of this. Um, but, you know, it's... It, it, they're they're tasked with implementing it, and you know I, th I think if we get too critical, we have to we have to worry about you know looking back and and what what, what would we have done that would have been better. So um, it, you know just just to just to put in perspective, kind of the situation that the USDA and the staff working on this have been put. Jonathan, there's a question about WIP Plus that I want you to read. It's the second to the bottom there. I want to get to it, but I don't understand what the language is that he's used. If there is no increase in farm income, Gary, what is the impact on farm capital and financing in 2020 and 2021? Yeah, that, so 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 that that that's a that's a good question. So far, up to this point, up to 20 end of 2020, we have seen slight deteriorations in debt to asset ratio and working capital going getting getting less. Going into 2021, you can expect, again, a deterioration in working capital and also a uh, increase in debt to asset capital on, on most farms. Most farms are going to be okay and will get financing for 2021. However, it's going to get 
increasingly difficult for lenders to make decisions because if they're going to require a positive cash flow, which many, which were, which is required in loan documentations in many organizations, it's going to be hard to do that when corn prices are three dollars and eight dollars. So, uh, the 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 it's going to be increasingly difficult to do that. And again, the ad hoc nature of the of the of the responses, and, and I mean, you can Are you going to build in an MFP payment in 2021 when it's not legislated and you don't know? Well, that you know, from a from a regulator regulator standpoint, that doesn't look good after the fact either. So, um, the lending decisions, I would expect for 2021. Uh, lenders are going to say X dollars per acre is what you got. And that X dollars per acre is going to go down in 2021, not up. Did you go through that whip plus? I don't understand that. I'll be honest. I don't, I don't, I read it, but I'm not really sure I've got an answer on that. Um, I mean, with, what we looked at on whip plus was that limited uh, sort of add on assistance from from last year, so I don't know if there's something new. I, I'm gonna have to dig to see what what that might be, unless Gary or Nick know anything more about WIP Plus. That I, did, I don't, I'm not sure where that's did, going. Did did they announce WIP Plus regulations recently? Do you know? I haven't been following it. Wait for the latest round. Yeah, yeah. I was at, but announced and delivered. Checks have been mailed from last year. He's asking uh, about 2020, and I don't see. Oh, going forward. No, the question is something about 2020, and I don't, I don't have anything on WIP Plus for 2020 right now that I've not seen anything. So okay. that's something we can we can make a note of and try and see if we can't uh, dig up what what might be on the on the plate. I've not seen it in the in the bills to date. We're uh, getting close on time here, so uh, if you could think out of the box, not constrained by USDA existing programs for the farm bill, what would your best kind of assistance to producers in this market climate be? <laughs> that is a, a lot. Of that's a great question. I mean, I think Nick uh, Nick makes it makes a good point. You know, we're we're struggling in this situation to to work through it. Um, one of the things that I sort of maybe one of the things that I sort of say in frustration a little bit is that. Given the uncertainties and given what this pandemic and the economic situation looks like, I, I go back to this sort of triage concept that the first priority isn't making payments right now, particularly when we've, we're just in planting and these crops haven't been made and there's a lot we don't know about what those losses look like. Payments can always be put into place later when we have more information. I come back to what I think has got to be the priority in this triage, which is getting food and I, and getting food to people that need food. And, and honestly, that does help farmers because we are in the business of producing food. And so everything that helps from the livestock and, the, and trying to help uh, these meat packing industry plants and whatnot, but just the, the supply chain disruptions and challenges, the kids who can't eat because they're not at school, all of those things right now to me seem to be the priority because we have got to get food to people who are struggling. Um, and then I think we look at payments down the road and we can take a lot more data as we understand the, un the way this is unfolding to work on those payment systems. So that's sort of, that's my two cents. Um, the best design programs in a situation like this are going to have myriad problems. Uh, there's no way to do that, even in the best of situations. Now we reach the top uh, of the hour, uh, which is generally when we'll stop, but I think we'll continue on. Go ahead, Gary, please. So I was just going to say, from a farm program perspective, the 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 I, the problem I see with the MFP, and again, I don't. This is not a criticism of the program, but a result of the programs is that if we are in fact looking at lower prices sustained in the long run, uh, the programs themselves have prevented adjustments that need to occur. The minute we take away the programs, those adjustments become harder, not easier to make from a financial perspective. So building in some adjustment process would seem to make sense. Uh, some, uh, some, some efforts to uh, 
cut cash rents would would would, would be would be good because right now as 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 we've seen farm programs in the past we give farm program payments to farmers and a lot of it gets capitalized in the land and that's what's happening as well now with mfp payments somebody mentioned that whip plus has not been paid out yet for 2019 i believe that depends on where you are uh at this point uh yeah. Because I, I know some of them have been paid out. Secretary Purdue has said USDA will address payment limits in the CFAP uh, final rule. This has to do with the 125 and probably to do with the livestock sector. And more importantly, would you care to crystal ball what the new limits might be? <laughs> crystal ball and payment limits. Now that's that's a that's a real challenge. I I. The thing I would say on payment limits with this is just the the reality that you, unlike sort of the payment limit fight we have in farm bills, which are worked out through the process, like what Nick said, with the legislative debates and all of that, here you have a fixed pot of money. So payment limits have a different impact. The more any one person or entity can take from that fixed pot of money, the less there is. So one of the things you'd almost love to see is a mechanism that kind of gave everybody you know, first round at one limit, and maybe you come back for a second round if you needed more because of the limit capped that off. But that's going to be a real challenge, particularly for livestock producers that haven't been in those places and for specialty crops. And those large California, uh, for example, California Central Valley operations are huge. Uh, and, you know, those are high value crops. So I can't crystal ball that because we, from my experience, we've not really fought through those debates around those crops in the same way. And that's going to be a whole different uh, challenge to create. I think, Gary, this one's for you. Does your outlook for 2021 change much whether China makes good on its ag purchases and obligations under the phase one? My outlook? No. I mean, it's just a bathtub. We, they buy it from us. They don't buy it from Brazil. They don't buy it from us. They buy it from Brazil. So, or, you know, so my outlook doesn't change. Nick may have a different opinion. So. No, I, mean, I, th I think that, I think that pretty accurately captures what we saw in 2018, 2019. I mean, there is a significant amount of diversion that goes on. If, if, you know, if they continue not buying from us, we'll continue to sell more to other markets like Europe. It, they're naturally higher costs, lower margin, however you want to look at it, markets. Otherwise, we would have been selling to them in the first place without the tariffs. But, um, you know, so it's not a, it's not as good of an outcome. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, the market adjusts uh, to, to much to our... Uh, surprise i don't know why we're surprised at that but um adjustments are made and 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 good, goods flow in different directions so there's a question uh what should producers be doing right now to maximize their income one of the things gary that you suggested if they have acres yet to plant is to go ahead and plant soybeans uh, if they can on those switchable acres anything else so sweet i uh, you know <laughs> Think about those, those those switchable acres. Again, I come back. I would actually think about marketing some of the 2020 crop. I know that marketing at the levels we're looking at seems extremely low, but it could be worse. So taking some of that risk management, I am not saying sell all the crop, but sell some of it again. Um, I think... Um, you know, honestly, the ma making sure you're maximizing your PPP and eat idle payment payments would be something that you should think about. And then I think in the long run, take we're all you're all going to survive, but in the long run, think about sitting on your how how am I going to how am I going to position my business farm business now that we're looking probably at below $4 corn at the very least, below $9 soybeans for at least a while. Um, how am I going to position my business and what, what do I, what sort of um, things do I have to add or what to that business to keep it going? 
Mr. Kappas, uh, this has been a question that's been brought up several times in different ways. Is the $14 billion for CCC in addition to the $19 billion announced on April the 17th? The, so the, the way 14, I read the house, if I'm if I understand the question, so the the there's three different things. The the what was in the CARES Act is a reimbursement for what has already been spent out of the CCC that doesn't kick in until sometime late June. The 19 billion that USDA announced is going to be using a variety of of uh, funding, including the 9.5 that was in the CARES Act. Then we have this 16.5 in payments announced that's included in the House Heroes Act, which has not passed Congress or been signed into law, so it's not actually in place. But that, the way it reads, that would be an additional uh, pot of funding for payments to uh, producers. So those those are. Uh, it's hard to add. It's hard to quite figure out the you know some of the overlap of this, but that's kind of how it breaks out right now. So this, what's in the House bill reads as if it is an additional 16.5 for payments. Anything else the rest of you, I don't know whether you've all been going through the questions that are left here. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else you want to address. There are a couple of things. Somebody wants to know if you think the value of the dollar is gonna go down might be outside, uh, you may have some, some thoughts on that, but probably outside of your bailiwick. I don't know whether anybody wants to address that. And then um, I was thinking there might be one other that I was looking at, I lost it here. Let me see, oh yes, uh, this one on what current CRP. Um, would current CRP acreage be eligible for the proposed payments under the HEROES Act? Uh, if you mean the con conservation program that's in the Hero HEROES Act, it says it's got to have been in production for the last three years, so planted or considered planted. Uh, right. CRP acres typically do not get any other assistance because they are rented out of production and they receive that annual payment. So I don't see anything directly for the to, that would be an add-on to those acres. I think we have made it to the end of our time. Thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of Nick Paulson, Jonathan Coppas, and Gary Schnicki, along with the technical director there in the home office, Jim Baltz, we appreciate you being with us. Don't forget that we've got more webinars coming up next Tuesday and Friday. We'll be talking about both ethanol that will happen on Tuesday and the livestock sector on Friday. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason, wishing you a good day.